Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Simon Mainwaring. I'll tell you all about Simon in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we show toward others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will discover that Simon is, you do it to bring people together and for a common cause. Simon Mainwaring, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. Thanks, so, John. Great. I want to tell folks all about you. You uh, are the founder and CEO of We First, which is a strategic consultancy accelerating growth and impact for purpose-driven brands. I love it. You're a member of the steering committee of Sustainable Brands and a Forbes Business Council and a fellow, this is the first one, of the Royal Society of Arts. Kudos. Uh, Simon is a jury member at Cannes. Um, his b book uh, has been in the top 100 impact companies. And your brand new book is We Lead. And, uh, or, excuse me, I got the title wrong. What is the lead title? With we. Yeah, Lead, lead with, with We. Lead with We. Okay, I got it. Say, shame on me, Simon. Uh, Simon, welcome to the show. So, Thank you so much, and thanks for everyone tuning in. Great. What's the lead uh, with we movement? What do you mean by that? So, Well, I think every company today, if you're a startup or a big global enterprise, you're facing some pretty challenging headwinds. You know, how do you improve your reputation? How do you attract the talent you need? How do you take product to market that people are going to want to buy? These are bottom line growth driver concerns for your business. Like how are you going to thrive and succeed and increase your profit in this really difficult set of circumstances. We've got the climate crisis, we've got the Black Lives Matter movement, we've got COVID. And increasingly through our work over the last 10 years at WeFirst, my company, I realized that we need a, need, need a new leadership mindset where all of us need to choose to lead and we need to do it collaboratively. It's not just the CEO, it's not the solopreneur anymore that needs to do it on their own behalf, but rather we need to work with our suppliers, with our employees, with consumers out there and work in new ways that I lay out in the book that will accelerate and scale your impact because the more you do that, the more it will drive your bottom line growth for the business, the more it will differentiate you in the marketplace, allow you to attract the people who want to invest in, buy from or work for companies doing good. So Lead With We is a simple idea for how you show up in a leadership capacity now to drive growth. Well, as you were speaking of that, the word that echoed in my mind is cooperation, one yeah. for all, all for one. Yeah. But so often we push that aside because of who we are, or because our culture. Have you thought on that, Simon? So yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a tendency in all of us to have either self-interest, which is fundamental to human nature, but there's also a selfishness side where profit for profit's sake, or you make money at the expense of others or the planet. We can't do that anymore. Why? Because companies can't survive in societies that fail. And, and, then, and the environment's breaking down, our social systems are breaking down. So all of us have to play a different role and show up in a way that is more supportive of the collective, that leverages capitalism and business to improve our supply chains, to look after our employees, to take better, be more responsible to our customers. And when you do that, they're going to build your business with you. Listening to you, I'm, I'm, what's echoing to me is the what the business roundtable came up with when it redefined that what stakeholder meant mm -hmm. as not simply shareholder, but the community. And a lot of people threw stones at it. I personally thought it was a move in the right direction. It's not unique, but it's exactly what you were saying. And we're all in this together. It's not society versus business or business versus you or me or well, but there's competition. Yes. But, and, and you come out of a very competitive world. Your original career, Career is advertising. Am I correct? So it is. I was an ad guy for 15 or 18 years in Australia, London, and you know, on Nike here in the US and Motorola. So yes. So and great. And so in the advertising world, your role is to promote and develop and promote a message and sustain it over time. So and over time, what gave you a, a change that you wanted to build your own company focused on the we versus you know, us versus them type of competitive world. So it's, it's, it's a great question. And what happened with me was, um, you know, after doing the advertising game all around the world, I actually came away feeling a bit empty. You know, I'd been the cool guy working on Nike. 
I, uh, you're you know, still I, a cool guy, Simon. That's okay. Yeah, it's gone now. It's gone now. And I had, I had a big, important job running Motorola uh, for their ad agency, Ogilvy. And yet I was left feeling a little bit empty by that experience. And then at the same time, as the universe would have it, I walked into my kitchen one day here in Los Angeles where I live, and there was five messages on the answering machine. One from my mother, my mother, my sister, my mother, all getting increasingly upset. And the last message was, Simon, dad died. He was calling to say goodbye. Call us when you wake up. And, you know, it was, it, I had, it was no planning on my part to make this shift. It was more that for the first time in my life, I got out of my own way because I was sufficiently destabilized personally and unchallenged professionally. And then what I was really responding to at the time, John, to your point is, the global economic meltdown was happening 2007, 2008. And I just thought it was unfair. And at the root of the problem, I thought to myself, why, why, why is this happening? Like, why are so many people suffering while a very small minority of people are doing so well? And it was the me first mentality that was really informing business and guiding business. And so the antidote or tonic to that in my mind was a we first, where you, you elevate the priority of the collective. That led to my first book, We First, and now we've been doing that work for 10 years with companies. And now the new book, you know, Lead With We, is really about how you can lead in a way that, you know, not only solves for these social and environmental crises, but also allows people to drive their growth by doing so. And that's only going to increase because these forces are so real and present in our lives. You know, listening to you, Simon, um, you may know of uh, Henry Mintzberg, the great management uh, thinker. Mm -hmm. um, and I had him on the show a couple of weeks ago. And one of his things, he's kind of in the, he comes from the world of strategy and management and academia. He has this new push uh, toward, you know, and he calls it it begins with the declaration of interdependence, exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about, how mm -hmm. we're all in this together. It's mm -hmm. business, society, NGOs, all of us working together mm -hmm. for a greater common cause and purpose. And, you know, we lose that type of thing. So it's the energy, which is what I think is interesting about you, Simon, because you come from, well, I'm going to just say it, the world of mammon. Get that message out there. But yeah. now you're shifting it to how do you communicate and connect in ways that people find meaning. May I say that? Yeah, that, that, that is true. And I think there's a difference with what I'm doing with Lead With We in the book. And I want to explain that difference. Yeah. The reality is business will be driven increasingly by how well companies solve for the issues that are shaping people's lives. Because every day we pick up our phone and we look in the headlines and it's the climate crisis or this or that or supply chain. There's issues everywhere that are causing problems. With that in mind, I was really concerned, John, that we're not moving far enough, fast enough. And I asked myself, as someone who's worked in the purpose space and helped brands, startups to major corporations define and integrate and scale their purpose, what's missing? And really, what's missing is the connected tissue between all of our efforts. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is we need to work more collaboratively with our internal stakeholders, our employees and our customers but also with competitors in our industry and across sector with government and the public sector and so on to accelerate and scale our efforts. Why? These crises that we're solving for are not sitting there statically in the future. They're actually compounding and they're coming back towards us in the present. Now that's, you know, it can be scary, but at the same time, it's a great opportunity for businesses that recognize that there's this hockey stick of expectation coming where the more your company is clear about what it stands for, the role it's playing in the world, why its products are good for you and good for the planet, the more the market forces are going to push you forward. And you've already seen it in the last five years, John. I mean, just look at five years ago, people were just starting to talk about whether they should be purposeful or not and who's doing it and not. And now everyone is falling over themselves talking about it. And that's not, it didn't come out of nowhere. It, became, it came out of the reality of the world we live in. So the book takes the 10 years of work that we've done with Tom's and Timberland and so many other brands and lays it out as a step-by-step -step blueprint for how you make sure your business can benefit from these market forces. And in so doing, we can all solve for these issues. So, I mean, you said something that intrigued me. Purpose is a world that uh, I've worked in for a long time. Is yeah. a decade ago, I wrote a book yeah. called Lead with Purpose. And but you said something that honestly I've never heard before. And you talked about businesses growing. You talked about scaling one's purpose or your purpose. What does that mean in terms of purpose? My perception is you have your purpose and you work toward it. What does it mean to scale it? So, yeah. You know, one of the observations I've made, I mean, just imagine business at large globally. By and large, the tapestry of business is still self-serving. 
you know, most companies are looking after their bottom line and often at the cost of people on the planet. And like, like stars in the night sky, you've got all these little purposeful companies that are doing their best efforts. But the challenge is those efforts aren't compounding. The challenge is we're not unlocking the synergies between them. So how do you scale it? A lot of purposeful businesses talk about the virtuous cycle. Do well by doing good. What I lay out and lead with we is the virtuous spiral, where you look at six different levels from you choosing to lead as an individual, then leading inside your company, then it's culture, then it's community with its customers and, and, and um, consumers, and then up at the societal level and finally the transcendent level. And I show how companies out there now are scaling their purpose, bringing it to life on an individual level, inside with their employees, with their customers, out in society at large, and pulling that through all the way so that they accelerate and scale their response to these challenges. And in the same way, by the same token, actually build their bottom line. And it's important for two reasons. If you want to benefit from these market forces and drive your growth in the next five to 10 years, these strategies are only going to get more important. But also, if we want to solve for these issues like climate and limit the amount of temperature rise and so on, we're going to have to do it together. So you know, the virtuous spiral of collectivized purpose, that's really the roadmap for the book, is all about how you take your good intentions of your purpose, but scale it on multiple levels to build your bottom line and your impact. I like the concept of spiral because it, it one I, I'm thinking of it building up on uh, one another. Yep. Here's a key concept. You said it starts with you, yeah. and then the next step is your team or your company. What? How the, did the you say? Level. Yeah. I mean, I want to call something out about that. You kindly mentioned the business roundtable earlier on, and the shift from you know um, shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. One of my big issues has been, as well intended as that sounds, too much of the conversation has been around stakeholder capitalism in the sense of let's all share in the benefits of capitalism, not just the shareholders. Everyone needs to benefit. But there hasn't been enough conversation, John, around sharing in the responsibilities of re-engineering capitalism. And so what do I mean? You, John, me, Simon, everything we do in our life is an opportunity to vote for a certain type of future. The car we drive, how much, whether we have a plant-based diet or not, what banks we put our money into and what, where they're investing that money, where we put our 401k or our pension, where we work, how we vote. We got in this mess together and we're not going to get out of it unless all of us show up differently. The same way we've shown up differently during COVID-19. We wear masks. We, we work from home. We keep a safe distance from people. We've all shown up differently because of a crisis. And so, you know, I think there's a big difference between sharing in the spoils of capitalism and sharing in the responsibilities. And I think that we are, if we're waiting for somebody else to come along and fix it, or we're waiting for somebody else to drive our business growth because we're solving, for, because these issues are getting solved. We're fools. We're going to have to show up differently and our businesses will be rewarded for doing so. Well, thank you for shining a light on one of my favorite words, and that's responsibility. Yeah. And that is because so often, you know, you're an immigrant to our country and, you know, we like we pride ourselves on our independence and um, these kinds of things. We toss out the word freedom, but too often we forget the other half of freedom, which is just what you said, yeah. responsibility. What am I going to do? So, yeah, no, I think um we all, a lot of us sort of want to kick the can down the road and think, oh, hopefully these problems will get solved by somebody else. But the reality is we created these problems every day by the choices we make. And each one of those choices in and of itself isn't so big, but they compound and they've created this mess. We need to make those same individual actions work in our favor now. Okay. Well, one. Okay, let me just. Be, I'm going to be devil's advocate here for a sure. second. All of what I don't. I embrace what you're saying, but I can hear the skeptics out there going. Mm. Well, it sounds good, you know, but isn't really business just in to make a, a buck? Isn't it yeah. self-interest that fuels it? So when you hear that, Simon, what's your response? So, Well, I mean, unfortunately, we're at a time, we now live in a time where if you really want to be self-interested, you're going to have to solve for these issues because your business can't survive if you've got a COVID environment. Your business can't survive if you're... You've got fires in Australia, fires in California, floods in Western Europe, Greece is on fire. Your business can't survive if people are resigning because they don't know what you stand for or they don't believe in your company or they think your products are harmful. So if you really want to be self-interested, 
you've got to show up more responsibly. And the reason I think it's possible now, unlike ever before, that business can do this job is that we've got the stakes, literally an existential crisis for humanity, the UN said code red for humanity and so on. We've got all the stakeholders at the table, everyone from leaders to employees, and now the investor class is calling for companies to do more good. And thirdly, we've got a new story for business. You've got everyone at Davos to COP26, all the way through to the business roundtable and so on, all talking about how we need to do capitalism differently. And so stake, stakeholder and story have all come together. And that's why it's not naive. It's actually possible for the first time. Okay, now I'm going to get even digging deeper. And I'm uh, embracing this because I am a capitalist. I believe in it powerfully. But some might say, okay, why do we need to reform capitalism? Why don't we just throw it out and come up with a more egalitarian society? So what's the response to that, Simon? You know, it's a complicated question because... Capitalism, capitalism is fungible. It changes over time. There's been lots of different expressions of it. It's not this static idea. Yet a lot of the time you hear people defending capitalism as if it's this locked thing that you know exists in a vacuum and isn't dynamic or fluid. That's one point. The second thing I'd say is of all the systems out there, capitalism in terms of the free market and you know competition and innovation has really been the driver of so much well-being for so many people around the world over a period of time. Not everyone, obviously, but for so many. And basically, what the challenge with capitalism right now is, companies can't survive in societies that fail. And the way that we're practicing capitalism right now, the whole is breaking down. The environment in which we live is breaking down. The social systems on which our businesses depend is breaking down. So we need to re-engineer capitalism to actually shore up the whole so the parts can thrive. And the truth is this, the way that we're practicing capitalism is putting more and more money in the hands of a very, very small number of people. You see it in the press every day. And at the same time, the growing disparity of wealth for the vast majority of people, many of whom live, under, live on less than six or $10 a day, capitalism isn't working in their favor. And so sometimes we try to defend capitalism thinking it's a static idea, and that it isn't dynamic and that it's working for everyone and it truly is a free market with competition and so on. It's not. It's monopolies. It's duopolies. It, the way it's being practiced right now is serving fewer and fewer people. And, you know, it's not about some people have being wealthy. That's fine. That's great. But it's now at that point of intolerance where the whole system is breaking down. And so we need to course correct. What you're really getting, to, getting back to your earlier thought about self-interest, right. it's almost that you can you can um, you cannot afford not to address these issues because they're not without intervention without a radical reconstruction of our practices or at least our thinking and the thinking is there now we must act on it so it, it we have to do this and i like the idea of the, you're talking about evolving forms of capitalism whether it's a step forward a step back whatever uh things change and so that's life. That's our culture. That's how yeah. we do that. So, so Simon, if you are a CEO of your firm and you work with firms. And so when you speak to senior leaders and they go, Simon, I'm on board. OK, what do I do next? Yeah. OK, there's several very basic steps. And I, I, I lay out a very detailed roadmap inside the book. So it's designed to give you all this 10 years of work so you don't need to think through it. But some of the basic steps. Firstly, you've got to choose to lead, John. Like, unless we actually make a conscious choice to say, within my industry, within my role inside a company, whether I'm a solopreneur or a massive corporation, I want to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. If you don't actually authentically do that, this whole conversation is a waste of time. And also, you just have to accept the consequences in terms of what happens in our future. Secondly, you have to look at your organization and do a very honest audit as to how you're showing up. Are you using good suppliers or are, they, or are they really harming things? Are you treating your people well? Are you, you know, are you embracing diversity and inclusion? Or are you really just business as usual and creating problems that we all know about in terms of social inequity and so on? Look at your products and say, you know, are they good for you? Are they good for people and good for the planet? Or are we actually doing more harm than good? And what would we need to do about that? So choose to lead. Secondly, do an audit of how you're showing up right now. And then thirdly, work with your internal stakeholders, your employees, your suppliers, and define what your purpose is, why you exist as a company, and then improve those things inside your company so that you are pointed in the right direction. Get your own house in order. 
So choose to lead, do an audit, work with internal stakeholders to get your own house in order on the, on the basis of having to find your purpose and then go to market. Then go to market and, and bring your products to market and in the context of your purpose and really your company and your product should be social proof of that purpose. Like we exist for that reason. We make these products for that reason. If you do those four things, choose to lead, audit, do, define your purpose and you know get your in-house in order and then take that story to market, you'll be ahead of 90% of brands out there. And buy a copy of your book and read it. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I, you know, here, here's a thought on that. Please do go to leadwithwe.com and buy a copy of the book or go to Amazon. It's available now and it, it just saves you 10 years of work and it'll show you how to use these market forces to build your business in a very difficult time that we're all facing in the next few years. Secondly, if I might, buy a second copy and give it to an entrepreneur or a corporate leader you know. Why? Because the, the whole premise of the book is we're all going to have to do it together. So you can double your impact by just giving someone a copy of the book. And it's amazing when you show them the new thinking with all the research, all the case studies and all the plan to follow, they will change and it will be because of you. And then if you feel so inspired, please do share it on social media. Just share Lead With We or go to leadwithwe.com and share it on social media. Whether we like it or not, the die is already cast. We're going to feel the, the, the results of climate change. We're going to feel the results of all of these issues we hear about in the press. We're already feeling with our supply chain issues. And unless we work together, our businesses can't thrive. And if you do show up this way, the market forces will move you forward. And that's what I want for everyone. You know, it's so often interesting. I'm listening to you and, and, I, and I'm thinking about this is so compelling and interesting and we must do it. And then I stop and think, okay, but what if we don't do it? Well, we only have to look at history yeah. at various crisis points. Where, going back for the times of the Romans, you know, what if they had done this or, yeah. uh, uh, or um, the Second World War? What if uh, uh, there or this First World War? What if the treaty yeah. had been negotiated differently? You know, what would have happened then? Or sure. in, in our own culture, uh, Vietnam. What if? How did that happen? All of these things so easy to diagnose the issues in a through the rearview mirror. The yeah. challenge is um, acting on it now. And I think you've you've actually held up a mirror. I think because it's for you're, you're reflecting the thinking of our times. Our challenge is do it. So what's holding us back, Simon? Yeah, there's a couple of things holding us back, but the point you made is really important, which is. We're lucky from the vantage point of We First, my company, we're in the boardrooms of all of these large and small companies and we see what's coming. So it's like we're reporting back from the future. And what the book really does is reverse engineer out of the future that's coming our way rather than building on the past. And that will set you up for success. What's in our way? Many things, um, but here's a few of them. I've observed that people have either been apathetic about it for the last five, six, seven decades you know, like we'll kick the can down the road, it'll be fixed by somebody else, whatever. And now they're going, oh my God, it's so big, there's nothing we can do about it. And they've gone straight from apathy to hopelessness. That's one concern. And they skip the bit, the action bit in the middle, which is where you need to choose to lead. Beyond that, there's three issues I'd call out. One, there's large legacy industries out there, like the energy sector and so on, that don't want things to change because they've made a lot of money doing what they've done. And they're very organized and they're, you know, they're very, as you saw with the COP26 conference, they have a lot of impact in terms of persuading people to change less quickly. Secondly, you've got the aspiring middle class in Brazil and India and China that want their day at the banquet table of capitalism. They want all the toys and they don't want things to go in a different direction. And then thirdly, you've got the vast majority of people around the world that live under, live on under 10 or $6 a day and they can't be thinking about changing the world. They're just trying to get clean water and survive. So... With all of that in mind, it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that we're going to need to really work together and build the momentum and, and provide marketplace solutions that support more people to take everybody with us. And here's the thing, John. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. The climate crisis does not care what car you drive, where you go on holidays, what politics you vote for. Like, how much more warning do we need, John? We've had a global <laughs> pandemic. We've had fires across the world. The, the, the data around the climate emergency says that last year was the hottest summer. This year, sorry, was the hottest summer in recorded history, as long globally that humanity has been recording weather. And it's going to be the coolest summer 
in our lifetimes moving forward. It's only going to get hotter. Like, how much more do we need to see? And how we, what, are we, what are we waiting for? Like, do we actually literally need to see our own individual personal homes on fire for us to realize that something's wrong? Or do we need to see the ocean actually like a dystopian sort of dead, uh, like, you know, body of water? Like, you know, this is our life support system, John. I am not saying that people need to do anything other than look after themselves. And they can actually build their business by solving for these issues. But it's only going to work if we do it together. No, and it's a powerful challenge to all of us. And, and 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 before the show, you were talking about you're going at the end of this year. You're going to go back to your native country, yeah. Australia, to to um, uh, to recharge, to regroup, and re and yeah. I go. And I'm thinking in my mind, yeah, you're going back to fire season. Exactly, so. exactly. And living here in LA, you know, it's not the holiday season anymore. It's fire season, and yeah. you know, this is going to continue. And but here's the thing. I'm incredibly optimistic. Why? Because the business sector is uniquely equipped with the resources, the reach and the innovation to really solve for these issues. Just look at the industries that are benefiting already. The clean beauty industry, um, clean food, um, sustainable apparel. Look at the auto industry, which was the most entrenched industry in the U.S., that 10 years ago fought Elon Musk very hard to sort of not transition away from combustion engines. And now every major automaker on the planet has committed to a transition completely to electric vehicles. Massive before your eyes transformations that are undeniable proof that industries that you'd never think could change are changing because of the reality of the world we live in. So if you're listening to this and you've got a startup or a large company, B2B or B2C, you only need to look around and see the world that we're in and say, hey, I better get ahead of these market forces. And that means you've got to be clear about your purpose, work collaboratively, like lead with we to provide a benefit to the greatest number of people. And those market forces will build your business. That's just the reality of the world we live in. Simon, so, mean, we are racing through this uh, quickly, but um, and I ask every guest and uh, a story to share a story of grace. And I think lead with we is a massive story. It's grace. It's showing grace for our humanity and for our planet. Do you have another story you want to add to that? So, you know, there's been a few experiences that were really sort of transformative um, for me. You know. Um, one, one experience with grace was, you know, when I wrote the epilogue to my first book, I quoted Dr. King's speech, the I have a dream speech um, that everyone knows so well. And, you know, the book went out and did well. And then I was kindly invited to the House of Commons in the UK and was part of an event there. And one of the ladies there came up afterwards and the book was given out to everyone. And she said, I want to sign something in your book and give it back to you. And I was like, uh, that's weird. Okay. You know, uh, not my intention as an author, but let's go with that. Yeah. And she said, dear Simon, thank you for keep for flying the standard and keeping my father's words alive, Dr. Bernice King. And it was his daughter. Yeah. And that for me was a full circle moment where an Australian who had no right to speak to these just very profound and, you know, significant cultural movements and so on, pointed to a transformative figure like Dr. King and then to have a connection to his daughter and had that circle be completed. And I have it here somewhere that's over there where, you know, I got the book and all that. And it was very, very meaningful to me. And so I think there's these moments in time where if we trust ourselves enough to lean into our heart and to, sh to, to leverage our innate goodness and go out there into the world and try and make a positive difference, there are synergies and I don't know, serendipity that comes along and you have moments that are truly humbling and you just go, wow, I feel like my time and my efforts are meaningful. And I think ultimately, I would say that fulfillment that we all want in life doesn't come from others outside in. It comes from inside out. You fill yourself up by what you give to others. And it took me most of my life to realize that. And the more I've been of service, the more I felt better about myself and felt like, hey, I'm okay with me, which is the big struggle that we all have in our lives. And I think um, this is a time for us all to better serve the people we care about, the people we work with, the communities in which we operate. And it's going to be incredibly fulfilling and rewarding in terms of our business growth at the same time. 
Well, what a powerful story about uh, Dr. King, Bernice. I know of her, and she yes. is a woman who lives with grace. And what a kind compliment to you. And mm. what you just said, the uh, summing up, uh, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And unless we treat one another uh, with a spirit of grace, the mm. greater good, uh, we won't get very far. So, mm. Simon, um, how can people find you? So, you know. My great passion or my appreciation would be if they go to leadwithwe.com and see the information about the book and grab a copy and share it with others. It's not about the book. It's about getting the message out there at a time when we really need it. You need it for your business. We need it for our future. Um, and if you're interested in my company, we First, it's wefirstbranding.com. But leadwithwe.com, I am so optimistic about the future because the stakes are now here. We have no choice. Let's just see what we can all do as business leaders together moving forward. Let's see this miraculous rebirth of business when we serve the natural world rather than steal from it. And I swear that the natural world will dazzle us with its inherent regenerative capacity that we saw during COVID. Habitats came back, rivers cleaned up, fish came back into oceans. The natural world will restore itself and in so doing, we'll look after our future. So let's give ourselves half a chance by giving the natural world half a chance and let the market forces build our businesses by doing so. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, I, it's an honor for me to have you on the show. And with that, I will say goodbye. So Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone.